All right, everyone, welcome. It is now the top of the hour. Thank you for attending today's installment of the CMV web series. Um, before we get started, I just have a few quick announcements. Um, first up, you see on the screen today's attendance URL and QR code. You just hold your camera up to that code as a focus on it. It should bring you to the page to record your attendance. If you don't want to do that, you can just go to the URL at the bottom of the screen. I will copy and paste that into the chat um, once we get started so you have it. And the other reminder is just if you have any questions, please be sure to put them into the Q&A box on Zoom, not the chat box. Um, and if I'm able to answer your question while um, the presentation is going on, I will. If it's one that I think that would be good to um, for everyone to hear, I'll mark it for to ask um, our presenters after we are finished. And if we can't get to them, remember our March 12th webinar is completely dedicated to questions and answers. Um, so with that, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Bradley Coe. Dr. Coe is a laboratory scientist in the Division of Genome Diagnostics at BC Children's Hospital. Prior to that, he worked with Dr. Evan Eichler at the University of Washington, studying rare genetic variation in developmental delay in autism. And today, he's going to be talking to us about the use of case control data in evaluating copy number variation. So take it away, Brad. All right. Thanks, Erin. Um, all right, so as Erin just mentioned, today I'll be talking about how, how we understand case control data, uh, particularly in the context of copy number variation, um, and use existing studies to help score these variants under these criteria. Um, so today we're talking about within the ACMG technical standards for uh, CNV scoring. We'll talk about rules 4L through 4O, which are how we integrate and score case control evidence into interpreting a CNV. So the objectives for today is I hope by the end of this lecture um, you'll have a better understanding of statistical significance and its interpretation in case control studies. Um, additionally, a better understanding of how effect size and clinical significance are in fact different from statistical significance and to understand some of the common methods that are used to actually examine CNVs for enrichment within uh, the studies we'll talk about. So a little bit of background uh, before we start in terms of what the goal of statistical analysis really is. So whenever we do a study, uh, we're never dealing with the entire actual population of a disease. We're always dealing with a subset that was available to us. So statistics are really just a mathematical toolbox to help us deal with this fact and that every time we do a study, we may get a slightly different result. So in this example here, I'm showing uh, for a population with a certain incidence of a disorder, if we grabbed 100 studies of 20 people, we would see a wide variety of results that came out, but most of those studies would tend close to the actual population incidence. And the, the entire goal of statistics is to try to help us understand how confident we are in the estimate from that study. So maybe 100 people isn't enough to actually be confident in that estimate, maybe we need 1,000, et cetera. So a little bit of terminology as we get started. Uh, whenever we talk about hypothesis testing and statistics, the two terms that come up the most are the null hypothesis and the an alternate hypothesis. So all statistical testing is built around trying to test between which of these hypotheses applies to your data. Um, the null hypothesis is typically that there's no difference between your groups, and the alternate hypothesis is that there is a difference between your groups. Uh, this testing can be either one-tailed, and by that I mean we're asking is one group specifically lower than another group, or is one group specifically greater than another group, or these tests can be two-tailed, and we're just in that case asking are the groups different in some way. Um, so in these contexts, we're usually asking the null hypothesis is that the incidence of the CNV is the same in cases and controls, and the alternate hypothesis is that the incidence of CNV is not the same in cases and controls. And then the one-tailed alternatives there are that the incidence of the CNV is greater in cases and controls or less in cases and controls. Two other terms that come up a lot are classification error rates. So statistics is really just our best guess of what the real data looks like based on a set of models. And when we apply these models, they, they won't always work and we'll make errors. And these are categorized as type 1 errors, which you'll see called alpha, 
Uh, this is the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis, so making a false positive association. And you'll commonly see 0.05 as your alpha threshold, which is what people call their threshold for their p-value, where you start saying anything with a number below that is probably or is statistically significant. Type 2 is a little bit more complicated, um, and this is related to the study as you designed it. And this is the error of rejecting a false null hypothesis, so making a false negative ascertainment. Um, power, which is how you most commonly will hear about this discussed, is simply 1 minus beta. And when we look at power, um, typically power analysis should be done before you start a study. Um, most studies will aim to have a power of about 0.8 or 80 percent. So one of the big challenges in reading statistics is actually interpreting what a p-value means. And this has become uh, very conflated, uh, so much so that the American Statistical Association published this great paper a couple years ago um, trying to define what a p-value really is and how to use it. And really, all a p-value tells you is how incompatible your data is with a specific statistical model. And I'll go into what that actually means in a second. But what's most important is what that doesn't mean. So p-values do not measure the probability that your studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data was produced by random chance alone. Um, also, a p-value does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. So that's important when we think about the fact that small p-values do not necessarily imply the presence of a larger or more important effect, and larger p-values do not imply the lack of an importance or even lack of an effect. Um, so just in general, read p-values with a bit of caution, but we'll come to, to how these, they're still useful. <laughs> so when we're working with count data in CNVs, we typically look in something called a contingency table. And that's a fancy name for a two-by-two two table where we look at individuals who carry a CNV versus individuals who don't carry a CNV and individuals who have a disease or do not have a disease. So when we test for enrichment, our tests are based on the fact that we're only seeing a subsample of the population of interest. So our observed values will have some inaccuracy associated with them. And we can model this using different distributions, such as binomial distributions or hypergeometric distributions, which basically just differ in how they treat sampling with or without replacement. Um, but most commonly, you'll see one of a small number of tests applied to this data. And the chi-squared test is a great test that can be calculated by hand. You'll see this quite frequently. Um, but a disadvantage of the chi-squared test is you need all of the counts in each of these cells uh, to be five or more to actually get an accurate p-value out of that test. Uh, the Fisher's is that test. It, um, tells you the same thing as the chi-squared test, but it's a much more complicated equation. Uh, so you need a computer to actually calculate the p-values. But the key point here is the Fisher's exact test doesn't have a minimum cell count. So if you have something with zero events and controls, you can use the Fisher's exact test, but you can't use a chi-squared test. All right, so what do p-values actually reflect? So a p-value is useful for comparing two distributions. So in this case, these curves could represent either heights in a population or the confidence around a frequency estimate uh, for cases and controls. If we look at a population where we use a larger population, our confidence bounds will narrow up and our distributions get a little tighter, um, but we have the same effect size. So in this case, a doubling of signal, that will give us a better p-value. Alternatively, a larger effect, so say in this case, three times the signal, um, but the exact same population size, the p-value will also increase. So the important point here is that the p-value isn't telling you which type of signal you're seeing. So if you really want to understand what you're seeing in your data, you need to look at it in a, a couple different ways. And that's where um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, descriptive statistics come into play. Um, so again, looking at our count data in a contingency table, um, two of the more useful numbers we can calculate are the probability of seeing the CNV. So that's just the proportion of carriers divided by the uh, with disease versus the proportion of carriers without disease. Uh, probabilities or risks are often phrased as something like you have a one in 10 chance of having this. Um, odds, 
are also frequently used, particularly in inside mathematical models like regressions. And that's um, odds are like saying instead of you have a one in ten chance, you have a one to nine chance. So it's the ratio of the counts in a, in a slightly different way. But it's important to remember that despite the fact that these numbers are fairly different in concept and they diverge as we get to larger and larger numbers, when we look at really rare events, um, which is what we're typically talking about with pathogenic CNVs, the numbers will actually be quite similar. So it's fairly safe to use them interchangeably when we're talking about these a couple events in a thousand uh, types of cases. So more useful than just looking at this point estimate of how often an event occurs within cases or how often it affects in controls, we want to look at the ratios of these measures. And this is really the effect size we'll talk about the most. So the odds ratio is simply the odds observed in the cases divided by the odds observed in the controls. Um, for various complex mathematical reasons, this is the primary statistic that regression analysis will give you. Um, the problem is effect size can often be misinterpreted as relative risk. Um, typically, odds ratios will be a little bit higher, particularly with common events. Um, and in general, odds ratios are best. Uh, they have statistical parameter uh, features that make them useful inside statistical tests, but they're not really easy to understand by a human reader. And that's where likelihood ratios or relative risk, or sometimes called the positive likelihood ratio, comes into play. And this is just simply the probability of having that CNV in a case divided by the probability of having that CNV in controls. Um, so I find personally that's much easier to understand than, than a ratio of odds. Um, and we tend to think of risks in these, um, in these likelihood ratio contexts uh, a little more easily. Um, now, uh, once we have these estimates, we can calculate confidence bounds, and I'll come over what those mean in a few seconds. But essentially, the 95% confidence bounds give us a reasonable range with which we can assume the true value actually occurs. So we did our one study. We found a likelihood ratio of 10, but we only analyzed a couple hundred people. So there's going to be some error associated with that estimate. So. Confidence bounds are simply a tool that helps us define the confidence level of an estimate. And just like p-values, the definitions can get a bit complicated here, um, depending on how picky you are about how you use the word probability. Um, but in general, uh, a narrow confidence bound means you have high confidence in your estimate, and your study is probably quite robust, whereas a wide confidence bound means you have a fairly low confidence in that estimate, and it's probably not robust across studies. Um, so to generate a confidence bound, we essentially take our observed count. We use a statistical model to say what the reasonable range is uh, that that value could represent in the full population instead of our study. Um, and what the confidence bound really says is that if we did, for a 95% confidence bound, if we did 100 studies and used the same method, 95% of them would contain the true population number. Um, so although that's a bit of a a complex interpretation, we can in general think of the fact that our 95% confidence bound for our study most likely contains or is quite close to the truth um, for that count. So here's a couple examples of um, real world CNVs with their p values and effect sizes. So what I plotted here in this uh, bar plot on the left is the negative log of the p value. And all that is is a trick to make small p-values uh, look like bigger numbers, and less significant values will have smaller numbers. And this dashed line is statistical significance. Um, so hopefully what's apparent here is if we look at these CNVs that didn't reach statistical significance in this particular study, the lower bounds of the likelihood ratio tend to encompass one. Um, so no effect is also included in our confidence window for that CNV. If we look at something like 3Q29 deletions, which are only ever seen in cases, uh, we of course know that zero control observations could be random chance, or maybe if we, so maybe if we grab more controls or did the study again, we'd find a couple events. So we can say the likelihood ratio is infinity here, because it's never seen in controls, but the lower confidence bound of that is, is down around two. Uh, 16P11.2, 
is an example where we have a much higher significance, um, but the likelihood ratio is fairly broad again. <coughs> Sorry, the likelihood ratio is slightly reduced. Um, so we see a point estimate around 11 and a lower bound of about four. So even though the observed likelihood ratio is a little bit lower for 16B1.2, the lower confidence bound is a bit higher um, because we have more counts. Uh, similarly, 7Q11.23 duplications uh, are less significant than 16P1.2, but we can see the lower confidence bound moved up and our point estimates off the chart. So really all I'm trying to show here is that p-values and effect sizes do have some association, but it's not perfect. So you really need to use both numbers to understand what your data is showing you. And this is particularly important when we start interpreting this data in the context of disease effect. So when we apply effect sizes, we know that a p-value or hopefully now we know a p-value alone can't tell us if a CMB is benign, completely penetrant, or a risk factor. We're really always working in this spectrum where an event can be present only in cases, in which case it's highly pathogenic, um, perhaps completely penetrant. It can be present in controls, uh, either more frequently or similar in frequency to our cases, which would likely be a benign CMB that probably has no effect. Or it can live in this large gray area of risk factors and incomplete penetrance where the CNV is seen in cases slightly more often than controls, um, but it's not completely excluded from control populations. So within our uh, scoring guidelines, a good starting point for looking at effect size of a dominant variant is to look for likelihood ratios above five with lower confidence bounds above one, and that's um, what's described in the appendix of the paper. The other important consideration is that clinical significance and statistical significance are not the same. And this is why the scoring metric has more sections than just case control data. Um, so this is an example I really quite liked from DePrel et al. Uh, looking at um, an example for looking at a difference in blood pressure between uh, two conditions. So they show with the blood pressure of certain patients in the confidence interval that we can get examples where something is not statistically significant nor clinically relevant, so the confidence bounds encompass no change, and they, the estimate doesn't pass this clinically significant threshold of four millimeters of mercury where you should do something. Um, an event could also be statistically significant and clinically relevant, um, so it passes the p-value and the effect size is large enough. We could have statistically significant but not clinically relevant. And that's quite an important caveat where we can have something that has, say, a likelihood ratio of 1.05 um, for developing developmental delay with an incredible p-value. And we have to think, how relevant is that in the clinic? And are you going to tell someone that they have a 1.05 times the chance of developing a condition? And that's, a, that's an important consideration. We could also have something that's clinically relevant but doesn't reach statistically significant, uh, statistical significance. Um, and when this occurs, we should start thinking about things like, are there other confounding factors in this study that could be quenching the statistical signal? And maybe if we broke the cases up in different ways or we looked at a more specific subset of cases, it might reach significance, or maybe it won't. Um, it could be just a complicated effect. Okay, so the important thing to consider here whenever we look at a p-value is just remember that statistical tests only ever answer the question you ask them. So we need to consider are the controls in our study a random population or unaffected? So that could affect how significant our observation is. Um, is the case cohort selected for a really broad phenotype? So are we looking at individuals with autism and microcephaly, or are we looking at individuals with any developmental delay? Uh, and similarly, do the CNB carriers have a broad or a specific phenotype? Uh, we need to ask whether there are enough samples in the study. Um, and if we're looking at multiple studies, do other studies have narrower confidence bounds on their effect sizes, um, maybe with or without a better p-value? for any of the reasons above. Um, we should always ask if the cases and controls are of similar or balanced ancestry. Um, there are predisposition loci and uh, haplotypes that could increase the rate of the CNV occurring in one ancestry, and that may not be uh, pathogenic, but just a benign signal between ancestries. 
histories. Um, and we should also, of course, consider if the gene of interest is autosomal recessive or dominant. Um, I'm typically talking about dominant disorders here, and you can expect that a recessive disorder may show enrichment in the clinical population, but uh, the effect ties will be quenched appropriately. Um, and finally, always look to see if your CNV study included the sex chromosomes. Uh, chromosome X and Y are complicated to analyze and are not in most studies. So if you don't see statistical significance or a comment on the CNV you're looking at, that doesn't mean uh, anything necessarily if it wasn't studied in the first place. So let's talk a little bit about how we use the uh, evaluate evidence in this context, um, particularly in the con context of whether our population sizes are large enough or we, we really trust this uh, effect size has been reported. So there's two ways to evaluate evidence. We can look at power, um, and I won't go to this website, but there's a great website for calculating power if you wish to look at it. Um, typically, a well-powered study will have power greater than 80%, but we should really be cautious about using power to forgive give negative results, and this comes up a lot in clinical trials, uh, where you see that your study was underpowered, you didn't find the effect, so you think maybe just adding more samples or keep going will, will bring me to significance, and that's kind of a dangerous uh, road to take. Um, keep in mind that power should always use the same statistical test as the study, um, but perhaps most importantly, just remember power, being underpowered doesn't mean a significant result is false. It just means that you could miss some true positives. So false negatives will happen, uh, but it doesn't mean you should doubt your true positives. Um, perhaps more useful than power, um, and I find much easier to comprehend, is using these confidence bounds. So as I mentioned before, these define the range in which the true value likely exists. Um, they're far easier to understand and investigate than data, and we can look at these for either the proportions, um, so the probability of the odds within a set, or the effect size, like the odds ratio and likelihood ratio. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So I'm going to show a couple quick examples. There's this website called Vassar Stats, which is useful if you want to try and do some calculations yourself for a study that may not have provided. Um, sorry, that may not have provided a result for you. Um, so I keep kidding the Zoom table uh, control bar on the top. So Vassar Stats has a bunch of useful little calculators. Um, under clinical research calculators, there's this calculator three. This lets you put some numbers into a contingency table, generate uh, likelihood ratios, or also called risk ratios and odds ratios. Here you can see for a rare event, um, the numbers are quite similar, so you can treat them fairly similar when you understand them. And it will also calculate p-values by a couple of methods. Um, it's limited and it can only work with uh, certain population sizes, but it's a good starting point. Um, and one thing you'll see is there are three p-values here uh, that are all slightly different. So that gets back to that point that the p-value isn't the probability of something, it's just telling you that that test detected a difference. Um, Another useful calculator for proportions um, is looking at the confidence interval of proportions. So say you have, uh, sorry, just trying to click on something without. Say so you have a study where you saw 10 individuals with an effect out of 100 individuals. You can calculate here and see that um, there's a couple of methods, just use the most conservative one typically. You can see that the real world expectation, if you saw 10 out of 100 individuals, is that the actual population incidence is probably between 5% and 18%. Um, so these little calculators can help get you a fair bit of the way to understanding whether the counts are interesting or not in a study you're looking at. Okay, however, um, one problem is that these web tools and um, things outside of real statistical packages, like um, using R, for example, don't tend to work with counts of zero. And that can be quite problematic with CNVs, as we'll have many examples where there are no observations and controls, and we want to understand how important that is. So one rule I really like in statistics is called this rule of threes, um, which is a fairly robust trick you can use, which just says that the upper confidence bound for no observations is three observations. Um, and this works on study sizes 
above about 30 individuals. So it's pretty applicable to the CNV work we do. Um, so let's go through an example to kind of highlight what I mean by that. So this is a table from Cooper et al. 2012, um, looking at 2P21 duplications that were identified in the study. We saw nine of 15,000 cases having this duplication and zero of 8,000 controls. So right away with the statistical significance, you might say, oh, that's infinite effect size, completely penetrant, terrific. Um, but if we use the rule of threes, um, we can say that we might expect as many as eight in eight thousand, sorry, three in eight thousand controls, and that's the equivalent to about six in a population the size of the cases. So nine versus six is obviously far less exciting than nine versus zero. So without having done any complex mathematics, we can use this rule of thumb to estimate that the lower end of the effect size is probably somewhere around one point five. So really, the study is telling us that the likelihood of the CNV being pathogenic is somewhere between 1.5 and infinity. And obviously that's quite a broad confidence bound and might not be something that's uh, clinically relevant to speak to your patients about. Um, in this case, using the actual complex math, we see that the lower confidence bound of likelihood ratio is 1.34. So we got pretty close without actually having to break out a statistical analysis program. And we'll come back to this as a case example, which Erica will present at the end of end of this session, uh, section of the talk. So now I want to move on a little bit to talk about um, the study I worked on back when I was in Evan Eichler's lab, looking at the signature genetics cohort, and mainly to use as an example of some of the ways that p-values and effect sizes are calculated in case controlled data. Um, we ended up doing quite a few different approaches, and most of these are common to many other studies you'll see. So this study was based on 29,000 children with intellectual disability or developmental delays, so a, a pretty broad phenotype. Um, it was also based on 20,000 population controls, so population controls aren't selected for being unaffected. We could have affected individuals in that set, um, but they should be at the incidence rate in the general population and potentially depleted because most of these studies were done on adults and we don't expect the most severe conditions to be present in adults who've signed informed consent to be involved in these studies. So one of the first methods to analyze CNVs are to use windows, either sliding or gene-based, and this is essentially just generating p-values at predetermined intervals. So we could use genes of those intervals and count how many CNVs intersect a coding region or an uncoding region of that gene, or these windows could be sliding defined on either the CNV scene themselves or a fixed window size. Um, both of these approaches are useful to help refine minimal common regions and identify focal pathogenic CNVs. Uh, but a disadvantage, and we can come to this a little bit later, is that this generates a large number of tests. So one problem with statistical testing is if you do many, many tests, you expect to make at least a couple of false positive associations, and there are tools and techniques to try to approach that. And that can get a bit challenging in, in window data. And in my study, these are present in supplementary table four and supplementary data set one, where supplementary table four is the p-values for individual genes. So for each gene, counting the number of deletions in cases, the number of deletions in controls, assigning a p-value, and a likelihood ratio with its confidence bounds. Uh, and where supplementary data set one is windowed p-values, um, in this case, I defined the windows by using the breakpoints of case CNVs and only large case CNVs. So here's an example of MBD5, um, where we see recurrent CNVs at the uh, UTR, uh, five prime UTR in specific. So these two plots down here are negative log P's of significance, so higher bar more significant, lower bar less significant. And we can see that if we look at gene level significance within the, so there's a bunch of CNVs within controls, which are on the bottom here within MBD5, and there's a bunch of CNVs within cases that are just at the front end. So we can see if we look at the significance across the gene, um, there's no significance observed, but we actually see significance for this olfactory receptor gene just up front due to the stack of cases. If we look at 
deletion and uh, sorry, p-values and sliding windows. We can see that the sliding window p-values spikes do not completely overlap with the gene-based sliding window spikes. So the key point to take across here is different methods will give you different regions that reach significance. And in this case, these are both telling you the same thing about the significant spike of CNVs in this region, but they're not completely overlapping because different methods we're using. So if we're comparing a study that used sliding windows versus one that used gene intersection, um, just make sure that you understand which method was used because it could point you in a slightly different direction when you're trying to find a minimal common region. Um, the other common approach is to look for specific CNVs and this is the most common approach when we're talking about genomic disorders. So recurrent CNVs with known or expected breakpoints. Uh, typically, we're talking about events that are mediated by large segmental duplication blocks or uh, low copy repeats, depending on the terminology you prefer, or subtelomeric deletion. So anything that has a common breakpoint region. And we can count these by looking at exact CMDs, so the CMD has the exact same start and end, or uh, using a trick called reciprocal overlap, which I'll come back to in a little bit. And one nice feature when we test this way is that we get a smaller list of mostly independent tests. And again, that's relevant for multiple testing correction. We don't need to penalize our p-values as much to have confidence in them. And in my study, this is represented in two separate supplementary tables. And I just want to show you one example. Um, so only cases are shown in this plot. Um, but what you can see is that these segmented duplication blocks on the bottom uh, tend to correlate with breakpoints, because that's actually the regions that are recombining and causing these CNVs to occur. The exact CNV from breakpoint A to breakpoint C is statistically enriched in cases, p-value of 0.0275. Um, but if you look, this uh, B to D CMV is also fairly common, but if we test that, it doesn't reach significance, but where the most significance is observed is, observed is for CMVs that span this B to C breakpoint region. So we can look at this in multiple ways, and they're all valid depending on our question. So if we want to know if our patient with an A to C deletion reaches pathogenic, uh, is pathogenic, we could ask ourselves, in, about the p-value of the A to C events, or we could use this minimal common region of B to Cs to say that that region contains a potentially even more significant region. Um, so there will be lots of situations where this happens in various combinations, and my main point is just to keep in mind that looking at just one number from one paper um, might not be sufficient to really understand what's happening. In, in the patient you're looking at. So I mentioned reciprocal overlap. And the definition of reciprocal overlap is if I say I'm looking at two CNBs with 50% reciprocal overlap, I'm saying CNB A overlaps CNB B by 50%, and CNB B overlaps CNB A by 50%. So the reason for applying this is that most CNB studies will contain multiple array platforms and these may have different array resolutions. Also, the breakpoints, if they're different between CNVs, could simply be an error in the CNV caller, um, or the breakpoints could be within segmental duplications. And segmental duplications, uh, breakpoints cannot be reliably placed within segmental duplications. They'll be highly inconsistent uh, because arrays aren't very trustworthy in those sites. So here's an example where this CNV and this CNV, um, this one looks a little bit larger than the one on the bottom. But if we actually look at the probe distribution, we can see that this is based on dozens of probes in a densely covered region, whereas the smaller CNV is based on only six probes. So there's no way to say that these aren't the same CNV using the actual arrays we analyzed. So whenever you're looking at a region in a study and you see some variation in the breakpoints, uh, Keep that in mind that if they're from different array platforms, they could be the same C and V. And that'll come in when you're looking into studies like a database of genomic variation and other accumulated uh, studies which accumulate data from multiple sources. Just keep in mind the array platforms that you're looking at and look for other nearby CNVs and see if maybe you should be combining things. 
All right. So let's use this uh, information I just presented and revisit rules 4L to 4N. Um, I just want to point you to a website that could be of use for some of these regions. Uh, the ClinGen dosage sensitivity map has some great write-ups and summaries of case control evidence for many of the recurrent CNBs. Um, so that's a good place to start if you're looking at a CNB that may already be well reviewed. So for 4L, we're specifically scoring regions that have consistent spe specific well-defined phenotypes. Uh, so a good example of this is the 5Q35 microdeletions, which cause SOTO syndrome. Uh, SOTO syndrome is characterized by a very distinctive set of facial features, uh, learning disabilities and overgrowth. Um, there's a great gene reviews article if you want to read it. And between 15 and 50 percent, depending on the ancestry of cases, are caused by the 5Q35 microdeletion. And so when I say caused, I mean this is a fully penetrant 100% associated region, multiple studies have shown statistical significance, and no controls have ever been seen. So that's something that we'd want to score quite strongly, um, and for the, all the studies that we observe for that. Um, the second 4M is a little bit more complicated. This is dealing with um, CMVs that may not have a consistent phenotype. So a good example of that is 16P11.2, breakpoint 4 to breakpoint 5 proximal duplications. Um, so, develop, these duplications are associated with a broad spectrum of phenotypes. I've listed here everything from general developmental delays, autism spectrum disorder, to some congenital anomalies. Um, uh, Weiss et al. did a great study on this region, looking at multiple cohorts with different specific phenotypes, and they saw the CNV in autism cases, bipolar cases, and a couple unscreened controls within a very large uh, Icelandic population. Uh, in my study, we saw that this region is seen in both cases and controls. It's statistically significant, but we look at the likelihood ratio, you can see we're seeing about 4.6, so not quite at the five that we're really confident in for uh, dominant disorder, um, and with a fairly tight range, but again encompassing a low end that's maybe a, a small to moderate effect to potentially quite a high effect. So. Um, Part of that wide range could come from the fact that my study is using a really broad range of phenotypes as well, um, so I can't necessarily say it specifically causes one or the other, and uh, why it all might have a bit better evidence for specific phenotypes. But in general, whenever something's this broad, uh, you want to store that under 4M, uh, because there is no certain phenotype for an individual carrying that event. And that likelihood ratio just simply reflects the likelihood of developing a phenotype. Um, 4N and perhaps 4O um, should also be uh, treated with just as much stringency as the other rules. Um, an example of this is 15Q13.3, recurrent duplications, uh, the churn of 7 to breakpoint 5 duplication. So unlike the deletion at this region, the duplications are very unlikely to be pathogenic. Uh, most of the published duplications have been identified as being inherited, uh, and disease linkage was weak or at most incompletely penetrant. In my study, we saw uh, no statistical significance, so peak is 0.576, which is somewhat useful on its own, but what's perhaps more useful is this likelihood ratio estimate of 0.98 with a confidence bound of 0.8 to 1.2. So we're pretty confident that this CNB is at most a minor effect and potentially no effect in cases. So the, these tight confidence bounds give us high confidence that the really, real incidence is similar in cases and controls. So that should be scored quite strongly in this category uh, compared to something which may have no statistical significance but a much broader confidence range. So just to summarize, um, there are several challenges that we should think of whenever we look at a CNV study. Um, Arrays uh, study can have multiple array platforms. So you need to know if the CNV could be detected in all cases or controls. Uh, you could have varying, varying ethnicity across your cases and controls, um, and this could have quite a big effect on common CNVs and small CNVs, which aren't under selection or predisposing haplotype presence. Um, also, just remember, case control analysis does not capture family structure. So we don't know if something is de novo or inherited. Um, we're not capturing segregation or affected parents, and that's obviously why this scoring uh, metric we've been talking about over this talk series has multiple sections. Um, 
And just remember, case control testing is blind to priors and supportive phenotypic evidence. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that p-values are useful, but we should be really cautious in over-interpreting them. Um, also that effect size is a powerful metric and that its confidence bounds are often more informative clinically than the p-value alone. Um, and just coming back to the fact that uh, a likely ratio around five, and this is, this is a pretty rough rule of thumb, is a good starting point for dominant conditions. Um, and when you're considering a study, um, consider if you believe that all the confounders that are important have actually been addressed. And this can often be addressed by looking at other studies that may have had an effect, uh, larger or smaller. And finally, ask if the population size is sufficient for the effect, uh, looking at the confidence bounds. And remember to treat negative findings with as much caution as positive findings. So at that point, I'm just going to stop sharing so Erica can continue with her case report or case analysis. Okay, thanks, Brad. Remember, uh, can you see my slides, Brad? I guess you're my yes, I can. Tech. All right. So, moving on to our case example today. Um, so, this is going to be case X, and um, as Brad already alluded to, we're going to be talking about two P two one. Um, so case X is an array identified duplication within 2P21, which is about 570 KB in size. Uh, this duplication was identified in a four-year-old male referred for genomic microarray testing due to developmental delay. Parental testing has not been performed up front, which is um, a pretty common scenario for genomic microarray testing. So starting with section one of the metric, by plugging this region into the UCSC genome browser, you can see that there are three genes in the region, um, one of which is non-coding RNA, and uh, two of which are protein coding messenger RNAs, which you could read more about by clicking on these um, individual genes in the region if you were in the UCSC genome browser. In section two, um, we assess whether the duplicated region overlaps triplosensitive, haploinsufficient, or benign genes and regions. And as we went over previously, this information can be reviewed within either genome browsers such as UCSC um, by loading in standard and downloadable tracks from the ClinGen Dose Sensitivity Map website. Um, and you can see that none of these genes are established dosage sensitive or, den or uh, benign, so you would uh, continue the evaluation. And then in section three, where we assess gene count, zero points would be given because this is a, a relatively small uh, CNP involving only three genes. So, um, just as a reminder, um, as we talked about out in um, in my talk a couple weeks ago, uh, we have moved the site, uh, the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity site that um, migration has been completed from NCBI to ClinGen. Um, we're still working on rerouting users to the new page. So in the meantime, if you could please navigate to our page either using links from the ClinGen site or if you, um, if you want, you can use this direct link at the bottom of uh, this slide here. And maybe Aaron, if you want, you could provide that in the chat, but certainly these slides will be available to everybody um, after the talk today. Um, so remember that in on the doses map, map website, what you have to do is uh, to search a region, you'll need to check your genome build here and um, make sure that it matches uh, what your array result shows, and then um, copy paste it in, in this format and click go to go to the region. So performing the search will return a list of genes in any annotated regions that overlap uh, your region of interest. So you can see here that five genes reside within the duplicated interval of this patient, um, including two predicted genes that were not shown when I looked this region up on the UCSC genome browser. Um, using my RefSeq genes track. So um, one other thing that I wanted to point out, uh, aside from the fact that none of these genes have currently been reviewed, um, is that um, in this section on the right-hand side, you can actually see um, which uh, genes are either um, fully encompassed or contained by the duplic duplicated region and those that 
are uh, partially overlapped or have a breakpoint within the duplicated region. In section four, we do detailed evaluation, um, which does include your internal laboratory data, and that's going to come up as we look at this region. Um, so as we do state in our supplemental info, the manuscript, the primary source for uh, the information that you're using in this section of the metric is peer-reviewed medical literature, but you can use supportive information, um, and it can actually be quite valuable when you are um, uh, looking at CNBs that may be leaning towards benign. Um, and this information comes from public data databases like ClinVar, um, Decipher, DGV Nomad, um, or also your laboratory's internal database. And in many labs, uh, including ours, the first step is, is actually often to, to check your internal laboratory data to see your experience with a particular CNB and how it's been reported. So looking at this region, you can see that this duplication has been seen in our laboratory many times. Um, and although I can't show you all the phenotypes, I can tell you that the phenotypes in indications vary quite widely. Um, since 2011, we have seen this uh, a large number of times, and the interpretation has gone from a suspicious BUS that was reported to a likely benign and benign dupe that is actually no longer reported in the lab. So um, just coming back to uh, the Cooper Co. and Girajan study from 2011, this is where this region was initially identified as a new potentially pathogenic locus by sliding window analysis. Brad already kind of went through um, how they conducted that study. So they're looking for signals that were uh, potentially enriched in the clinical population. And at this time um, that the duplication was identified, um, many labs, including ours, um, hadn't really seen it um, too often, and so that was one of the reasons why we began to report it. Um, one other note I wanted to just make is that the coordinates here are in HG18. That's an important thing to pay attention to. Um, but as the data sets grew and platforms evolved, um, as was in our lab's experience, more duplications were observed in both cases and controls. And so um, this is actually a snapshot from the UCSC genome browser showing updated case control data, um, which Brad discussed earlier. Uh, you can see that there are roughly equal frequencies of duplications of this region in the cases and controls. And, um, as Brad went over earlier, the p-values and likelihood ratios can be calculated from this data, data set. And so I um, included those values here. Brad helped me calculate that for, for this region. So you can see that um, the p-value shows that um, there is a, a lack of significance between observations in cases controls, uh, cases versus controls with a likelihood ratio that's on the uh, lower end, uh, definitely below five. Um, so, um, overall, this would re result in a points reduction using section 4N of the metric. Um, here, I'm going to use the default score of negative 0.9, but I do want to, um, you know, note that a range is provided to account for factors that um, Brad already kind of went over. If you have a lowered sample size, lowered overall frequency, technical factors. These can all really influence the quality of the statistics that are used in case control studies. And so if you have a concern for possible bias, um, users of this metric always have the option to modify the points deducted or even exclude a piece of evidence if uh, it's too weak to use. So over the next few webinars to follow today, we're going to learn more about how you can assess what constitutes a common CNV using DGV and NOMAD. And um, uh, though a variant may not have been evaluated as a part of a formal case control, case control study, uh, it's still possible to gather information about its presence or absence in the general population through uh, these resources using category 4.0. Oh, I saw there was a question in the chat about the use of this section. Um, so in general, and for the purposes of clinical CNB evaluation, a CNB can be considered common in the general population if it's present at a frequency of 1% or greater in the DGV Gold Standard data set or any similar high confidence data set. Variation observed at this frequency in the general population may receive the default number of points, so that would be negative 
one, which would get you to benign, but you can assign less weight if a variant is observed um, at a frequency lower than 1%. So, in fact, this duplication has been um, observed in the DGB. There is a gold standard variant, and it has been observed at a frequency of 0.08%, so not quite enough um, if we were going to look at just general population frequency alone to use this section of the metric, but since we can calculate case control data, we'll use that here. Um, so, so, so far we've illustrated with the 2P21 variant um, that databases, including your own lab's clinical database, can be really useful for evaluating these types of variants. Um, we do recommend that laboratories develop processes to document, track, and reevaluate previously classified CNVs, including pathogenic CNVs, BUS, and those that have been determined to represent benign variation, um, and share this information with the community through databases like ClinVar. Um, and um, we also recommend that you use judgment when opting to include data from the, either the public databases or your own internal lab databases evidence. Um, for data available in public databases, you should consider the amount of supportive evidence available uh, to allow for independent evaluation of the clinical classification provided. Uh, you should also consider possible sources of bias that we've already um, kind of gone over here today. Um, so this figure shows the 2P21 duplication, which is outlined by this green box here. That's a duplicated region. Um, in uh, ClinVar, you can see that this, uh, for this region, there are, are a variety of clinical specifications that have been submitted. Some of these are even from our own laboratory. Um, and so we do encourage um, users to um, use caution when, when, you know, trying to evaluate this information, pay attention to the submission date with this, these clinically encountered CNBs and consider that the date of last evaluation may actually be um, earlier in time. So if there are conflicts that exist, like for this region, um, this may actually reflect a historical change in the interpretation of clinical significance because new information does continue to emerge over time. So in the last section, we evaluate inheritance patterns for the variants of the patient being studied. And in this case, since we don't have uh, parents, uh, this variant would be given zero points and you would um, move on to the end. Um, but as we near the end of the evaluation, we've accounted for case control data uh, that refutes our CNV's pathogenicity. Uh, there's one other section that we can use to account for the fact that we have seen this variant many, many times if with varied indications, which is section 4D. So here, um, if the phenotype is either not consistent with what's expected for a, a gene or variant, um, or simply not consistent in general, you can use clinical judgment to determine if this should result in uh, a deduction of points. And so I will be using this section as well, just given um, the, the wide range of uh, inconsistent phenotypes uh, in our own experience. So, um, so taking this all into account, uh, if we add up the total number of points here, we'd actually be deducting points. So I've given the, the standard negative 0.3 for um, section 4D because we do have numerous instances in our internal database with varied indications. And then I've used section 4N to calculate the case control data. It's not enriched. It's actually present in multiple controlled data sets. So the total number of points would be less than negative one, which would result in a benign classification. Okay. All right. So Aaron, thank you. I think and we're ready. Yes. I was actually in the middle of typing an answer to someone else. So while I am doing that, would you mind just showing people where you got the um, the co et al case and control data and UCSD? That's one of the questions in the chat and one of the things I was going to ask you to do because I think that would be helpful for people to see. <clears throat> was that uh, Erica or me? Whoever, who, it's Erica's got it, yes. Where do you get this? Okay, Erica, that you're so that's great. Can you walk people through where they can find it? 
And if you're talking, Erica, you might be on mute. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> Too fast. <laughs> now we lost right. your screen. There okay. you go. So let me back it up a, a little bit here. So in the UCSC genome browser, this is actually this region. I was just taking snapshots. So I have loaded in this um, file copy number variation uh, morbidity map of developmental delay case and control. Um, this is the, the Cooper and Co. combined data sets that Brad can talk a little bit more about if needed. But you scroll down to the bottom here under phenotype and literature. This is the track that you would add. Um, it's the developmental delay track. And so you can open, uh, look at uh, the source of this information by just right clicking there and you can read more about how to look at the data. All right, um, another question that came in was, how would you suggest to interpret p-values in cohort studies? Yeah, I, I saw that question and it's tricky, so I was thinking about that a bit. Um, so in, in general, uh, cohort studies and case control studies, even though they're fairly different in structure, you can still think of them the same way, but they have strengths and weaknesses. Um, so in a cohort study, say we're looking at something with a really broad phenotype, phenotype we, we might be underpowered in that case because the people who do have the CNV might not have a specific phenotype or condition more often than the people who don't have a CNV, um, whereas the case control analysis might be able to tease out those weak effects a little more readily. Um, whereas a cohort study for a strong dominant CNV, like say uh, the Soto syndrome example, testing for people who have this distinctive facial feature set would be quite a bit more powerful than the case control analysis. Um, so as a little bit of a long-winded way around that, I think they both show very similar things. They'll both give you p-values, likelihood ratios, odds ratios, or various effect sizes but they're just coming to it in a different way. And as long as you understand that they have different strengths and weaknesses, um, I think they're both valid approaches to look at this sort of, sort of question. All right, then we had another question. Um, for a statistically significant study of, say, a developmental delay cohort, um, he's asking, what, what category would you use for M versus for L? And those are differentiated by the specificity of the phenotype. In other words, how much emphasis does one put on the specificity of phenotype versus the effect size when you're trying to decide between 4L and 4M? So if you're in a developmental delay cohort, but the study reports a large effect size, does that matter? Or would you still go with a nonspecific phenotype category? Erica, maybe you want to comment on that? Yeah, so um, so we do recommend um, to look at the phenotypic specificity, um, and I I agree with the. Um, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the question here again. So um, yeah, I, I agree with the assumption here that you should use the the lowered points based on the phenotype. Um, Yes, I would agree with that. Through the, the next half of this question. Um, as well. I mean, if the phenotype is developmental delay, there are so many things to consider there, like how well were the cases phenotype and how well were the controlled phenotype. We know these kind of neurodevelopmental disorder phenotypes can present in a number of different ways, um, both demonstrable and not. So, so that kind of gets difficult when looking at data in that particular condition. And so I think the lower um, category is most appropriate. Would you agree? Yeah. And the other thing that I would point out, I'm sharing my slides again, um, is that um, we do have a, a, the same max for each of these categories. It's just that you need um, multiple studies uh, to, 
to reach that max for non non-specific phenotypes. All right. Well, we are now at the end of the hour. I want to thank um, both of our speakers, Erica and Brad, um, for their time today. Um, we will get all this information up on our website. The attendance URL is in the chat, but it's also in your reminder email from this week and will be in your one for next week. Um, and we will meet again next week when we'll be hearing from Ryan Collins of The Broad about Nomad SP. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron.